Hello, I'm Bayless Conley, and I would like to invite you to sit down with me for the next few minutes as we study the scriptures together. And I guarantee you, you will not be bored. We're actually on a series looking at the things that God tells us that we need to pursue, running after the things that are most important in life. So, hey, put your seatbelt on, put your helmet on. Let's get into the Word together. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley. In life, we all face uncertainty, whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose. One thing is for certain, God sees you. He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. Did you know that there are a number of things in the Bible that God tells us we should pursue, that we should go after them. Number one, because they're important. Number two is because even though they may be within the scope of God's will for us, something he wants us to possess or experience or or live in or walk in, we will not experience them. We we won't possess them. We, we, We won't imbibe them if we don't go after them because they are not automatic. If you were with us last time, we talked about pursuing peace. And this next one, oh my, it is so important. Pursuing the knowledge of God. Let me read to you from Hosea chapter 6. Hosea was an Old Testament prophet, and he actually said some things that, that point to the New Testament. They point to Jesus Christ, and they point to us. These are amazing verses. Hosea 6 verses 1 to 3 says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain on the earth. These verses actually point to Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. God, it says that God is torn, he'll heal us. He's stricken, he'll bind us up. This this actually encompasses the mystery of substitution and identification. When Jesus was hanging upon the cross, he was there as our substitute. And literally, the, the wrath of God against the sin of man smote Jesus, crushed him, but he was being smitten. He was being crushed in our behalf. And after three days, once the the claims of God's eternal justice were forever satisfied, God raised him up on the third day, even as it says here in Hosea 6 and 2. But in God's eyes, it was me on the cross. In God's eyes, it was you on the cross. In God's eyes, it, it was you. It was me being raised up. Jesus died as our substitute, and we identify completely with his death. The Bible says this in Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, even when we were dead in trespasses, that God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It was all substitution and in a mystery Hosea prophesies by the Spirit of God talking about that. And the next thing he says is, let us know. It's verse 3 of Hosea 6. Did you know that Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. My friend, salvation is not about rituals, rules, and regulations. It's about having a relationship with God. It's about knowing him. So he said, let us know. And then he said, let us pursue, let us go after, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That is so important. We we get saved and then we, we need to pursue the knowledge of God. And when we do, the end of that verse says, he will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain on the earth. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know the latter rain and the former rain are both types and shadows pointing to the Holy Spirit. So we get saved, we put our trust in Christ and his sacrifice is our substitute. And now we know him 
And yet we need to pursue a deeper and more intimate knowledge of God. And as we make that pursuit, the Holy Spirit comes to us and he brings that knowledge to us. He teaches us. So how do we pursue the knowledge of God? Well, there's several ways. And I think the starting point is nature. Yes, nature. You know, the Bible says this in Psalm 19 and 1, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Creation points to the creator. Listen to this, Romans 1, verses 19 and 20. It says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Ever since the world was created, God has revealed his character, his nature, his divine attributes through his creation. Creation speaks to the human heart about God. I still find it very easy, personally, to connect with God when I'm in nature. Everything around me seems to speak about God. You know, one of my, my hobbies in life, I may, actually I, pro I probably should say one of my passions in life, is I, I free dive and I spear fish. And when I'm holding my breath and swimming under the ocean's waves, you see fish with paint jobs on them that you think, I didn't know that color even existed. And you see things growing there and, and, you know, creatures flourishing there that are just mind-blowing. They didn't just happen. There has to be a creator. I remember hiking with some friends once, and we are high back in the High Sierra Mountains in California in a remote area, and a thunderstorm rolled through. And I climbed to the top of this, this outcropping and got in sort of this little cave, and it was open in front of me in this thunderstorm is thunder is crashing around me and there's lightning and the wind is blowing and I tell you I sensed God's presence and that earthly power that was on display spoke to me about a greater power now that is not an excuse to not go to church you know some people say well yeah I don't believe in church I mean the 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 Sky is my cathedral and the, the trees are the congregation. Well, all right, you know, I get you, but the Bible still says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together and we should gather together all the more as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. Yet it is true that we gain an important knowledge of God through nature. I mean, the scripture says, go to the ant, observe the ant. You can learn lessons from God. Jesus said, consider the ravens. He said, consider the lilies of the field. Even Martin Luther said this. He says, God has written the promise of resurrection on every leaf of springtime. God has hidden lessons for us about himself in creation. And we need to begin to pursue God. And I think that's a starting point. It's not a finishing point. It is a starting point. When's the last time you went out and just sat down? If you happen to live in a coastal area, you sat down on the beach and watched a sunrise or a sunset. You looked at the expanse of the sky. You looked at the millions of billions, trillions of tiny grains of sand. It lets you know that there's intelligent behind, design behind that. When's the last time you went out and, and laid down in the forest under a tree and watched the squirrels jump from branch to branch and watched the little birds flit around and you listened to the wind through the leaves? When's the last time you walked along next to a babbling brook or laid down in a meadow? And, you know, you may be living in an inner city area. Okay, when's the last time you went to the, the city park? and just took a walk. Nature speaks to the human heart about God. The second way is we, we pursue the knowledge of God, obviously, is through his word. 
The Bible is a revelation of who God is. It's a revelation of his thoughts, of his character, of his nature. It tells about who God is. It tells about his plan for man. It tells about his will for mankind. And we really can't know God well at all without knowing his word. It's a revelation of himself. Of himself. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they're spirit and they are life. You know, the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Perhaps you've heard about some people that have invested several thousand dollars in some unknown stock and they became multimillionaires. The stock just skyrocketed. Well, you know what? I did something better than that. I got wealthy on a 35 cent investment. Was it a yard sale? And there was an old leather Bible there. I was a brand new Christian. Price, 35 cents. That 35 cent investment changed my life. And I sat up into the wee hours of the morning reading through that Bible. I started in Genesis. It was awesome. Exodus, I got a little bogged down in Leviticus, you know, and all different measurements and some language I didn't understand, but I kept going. And God began to speak to me and reveal things to me that I still hold dear to this day, things that are still foundational for my life to this day. Take time to prayerfully unhurriedly read the Bible, read the scriptures. God will speak to you and he will reveal himself through the word. You know, having said that we can find the knowledge of God in nature, I just feel like I need to reemphasize a certain point because there are a lot of people, they are nature lovers. In fact, nature itself has become a religion to many people in these days. People have begun to actually worship creation. Now, when I talk about learning lessons about God and finding God in nature, I'm not talking about worshiping nature. Some people think, you know, that, that nature is more important than the people that live in this world. No, friend, the earth was created for man. Man wasn't created for the earth. And so I, I'm not about being a nature worshiper. You know, I, I, I don't think animals are more important than people. I don't think fish are more important than people. I think we need to manage the resources we have on this planet and certainly be good stewards of it. But I'm talking about actually gaining a, a revelation of God's nature as we look at his creation. I remember when I was in college, there was a, a guy that, that, I knew we became friends, and he was probably one of the most immoral people I have ever met. In fact, he, he would do things sometimes that would make me and my other friends just cringe, like, man, don't you have any conscience at all? And I ended up getting saved in a little street mission, and I went back to my friends and told them all about Jesus, and this, this guy that was the most immoral one of the group said, oh, yeah, I was raised in church. I said, What? He said, oh, yeah, I don't go to church anymore. I don't believe in that. And he said, you know, what? when I go outside like nature, that, that's my church. And, and the trees are the congregation. You know, again, I get it because I love nature and I know God speaks to us through nature. But this guy stopped, you know, fellowshipping with the saints. And he got out there in a place where he was vulnerable. He was isolated from the church family, from the flock. You know what wolves call? the first sheep that leaves the flock, they call that sheep lunch. You know what happens to the first banana that leaves the bunch? It gets skinned. And he got out there, got isolated. Proverbs 18, 1 says, the one that isolates himself rages against all wise judgment. And he ended up getting deceived and falling farther and farther away from the Lord. Now, listen, you may be a believer in Jesus Christ, and I just want to ask you very bluntly, do you go to church? If you don't, you need to find a good Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, you know, church that, that's into sharing the gospel with the lost and the dying world, and you need to become a part, not just for what you can get out of it, but how you can get in there and give something and support it with your prayers and, and your, your good spirit and, and with your finances. It's important. The writer of Hebrews says, do not get into the habit that some people have of not assembling together. But we need to assemble together. We need to come together as a church more and more and more. 
as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. And my friend, I believe that day is approaching soon. The, the daily newspapers reading like the book of Revelation lately. So I, I just want to encourage you, if you're out of church and you're a believer, you need to get in church. Get among the fellowship of the saints. Things happen when we corporately worship and when we sit under the teaching of the word that will not happen when we're isolated and alone. Things that we can't experience when we're isolated and alone. So, hey, I love nature. I see God in nature, but I am a church man. I believe in the body of Christ. Let me speak to you about a couple of other ways that we are to pursue the knowledge of the Lord. The next one I want to mention to you is prayer. You know, the main object of prayer is not to read our latest Christmas list to our celestial Santa Claus, but the main reason for prayer is to connect with God, to fellowship with God. You know, from our, our foundational verse in Hosea 6 and 3, it says, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Both that word know and the word knowledge in the Hebrew language speak of an experiential knowledge. It means to know through involvement. And yes, prayer is to be a discipline. And sometimes, let's, let's be frank, sometimes prayer seems as dry as a desert and as dead as a graveyard. And we need to push through during those times and pray anyway. But other times when we pray, Suddenly, God reveals himself in unmistakable, astonishing, sometimes alarming ways. I know he's always present with us, but sometimes he makes his presence known when we're in the place of prayer where all we can do is weep and the only words that come from our lips are holy, holy, holy is the Lord. If you've never had that kind of prayer, my friend, you stay with it. It says that when we seek the knowledge of God, when we pursue the knowledge of God, this intimate experiential knowledge that he will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain upon the earth. We gain knowledge of God as we pray. I remember there was a brother in church years ago that I befriended and he was struggling with an old drug addiction. You know, he'd given his life to Jesus, but he, you know, just had this pattern of falling back into, you know, actually what he was using was crack cocaine. And I worked with the guy and prayed with the guy and counseled the guy. And, and finally, just out of desperation, because he's going to lose his marriage and lose everything else, he, he would lock himself in his closet every morning for an hour and a half and pray before he'd get up and go to work. Nothing happened first day, second day, third day, first week, second, nothing happened, but he stayed with it. He stayed with it. And then one day he came over to my house, knocking on my door, woke me up at 630 in the morning. He said, Pastor, Pastor, he's real. He's real. God came to me in my prayer closet. He's real. He's real. I will never forget the look of absolute astonishment and wonder on his face. It seemed like the glory of heaven was radiating from him. The Lord came to him, didn't just refresh him, but set him free. Finally, here's another way that we should pursue the knowledge of God is by associating with people that know him. God will reveal himself to us through others. You think about it. Joshua learned about God from Moses. Elisha learned about God from Elijah, Titus, Timothy, and Onesimus. They learned about God from the apostle Paul. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 20, he that walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Second Timothy 2, 2, it says, and the things you have heard from me, Paul said to Timothy, the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It should be our goal to, to transmit what we have of God and download it into other people. You know, I remember when I was in college, there I took a, a class on Native American culture, and the, the professor was a sort of a guru, wannabe, pot-smoking, you know, 
lover of nature. And, you know, he didn't have any experiential knowledge of Native American culture at all. He showed us some films and talked about stuff that he'd read in books. And, and honestly, I didn't get anything out of that class. But then one day I was with some friends and we were in a little town in the back country of Oregon. And I remember we're walking down this side street and out in the yard were just these beautiful chairs and um, tables and knickknacks and they were just amazing. And so we stopped and there was an old man. In fact, I worked it out last night, just thinking about today. If he were still alive today, he'd be 120 years old today. This old man was there and he took us into his shop and he made all of that by hand, not a single power tool. We sat in his house and he shared his story. He was born around 1900. He was orphaned and he was taken in by a couple of old buffalo hunters. And both of these buffalo hunters in the 1870s and the 1880s, they had lived, both of them, among Native American tribes. And so they, they had spent literally decades of their life living among the Native Americans. And then these two old buffalo hunters, you know, had found the place in their heart to adopt this young orphan. And they raised him and they taught him the things that they'd learned from those Native Americans. And just the, about hour and a half that I spent there with that guy, I learned more from him in an hour and a half than I had during that whole course with the pot smoking professor. I mean, he taught... I. He, I can make you an arrowhead. He, he sat down, had a piece of deer antler and a piece of obsidian, a piece of leather spread out, and he made beautiful, perfect arrowheads. He could make them in under two minutes. It was amazing. I had no idea that the way to make an arrowhead was to chip the obsidian with a piece of deer antler, but that's what he did. He taught me how to whistle with the cap of an acorn or with a, a little flat stone between my fingers, an ear shattering whistle that I can still do to this day. He shared with me some, some insights on deer hunting that, that the Native Americans would do in that region. And there, there are things that I still use today and employ today if I'm out deer hunting, just things I've learned about nature. But it's because he, he knew experientially those things. And if you can find someone that has walked with God, that knows God personally, my friend, take him out to lunch and ask them a battery of questions, and then listen to what they have to say. When we pursue the knowledge of God, he comes to us. He will come to us like the rain and like the latter rain. We need to pursue him through prayer. We need to pursue him through the word. We need to look for God in nature, for nature speaks to us of God. But God will also come to us and reveal himself to us through those that know him. And the truth is, you don't have time to make all the mistakes yourself. You don't have time to learn it all yourself. Learn from somebody else's mistakes. You know, I think one of the, the greatest tragedies in the church today is we, we don't, in some cases, see the generations intermingling. We need to find out what our fathers and our fathers' fathers have done and the victories they've won for God and the things that they've experienced. Listen, young person, take a gray head out to lunch. Be one of the wisest investments that you have ever made. And if you're an older person, don't live a cloistered life. Don't be a grumpy old person. Man, be generous and, and you know, be, be lighthearted and, and look for an opportunity to share with a younger person. You know, we, we just got to find some middle ground. In the church is about Abraham resourcing Isaac, Isaac releasing Jacob, and Jacob revering Abraham. Three generations living and working together as we pursue the knowledge of God together. And I, for one, am looking forward to God coming to me in alarming, astonishing, refreshing, and new ways as I search for the knowledge of him in the pages of his book as I search for him on my knees in the place of prayer, as I take a walk in nature, as I swim in, in his beautiful ocean, as I talk to others that know him, pursue the knowledge of God. Let that be one of your highest aims in life. There's nothing more important than knowing God and knowing about him, and then let God use you to pass on what you know to somebody else 
Friend, do it in Jesus' name, and you should start today. I am so glad you joined me for this installment in our series entitled Great Pursuits. I'm personally so excited about this as we're going to go through this list of things in the Bible that God tells us we should pursue. And listen, it's just going to get better and better and better and better. In fact, if you don't join me, I'm just going to tell you in advance, you're going to miss half of your life. So you need to get involved in, in this whole series and find out the things that God tells us to pursue. Um, listen, I pray that God blesses you richly, that he opens the eyes of your understanding so you can see him in a deeper and a fuller way. And as always, I just want to say thank you to our partners, those that, that support us through prayer and through consistent giving. We could not do what we do without your aid and assistance. My friend, we are joining hands and we're bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.